Did you know that a rotten tooth could potentially lead to a brain aneurysm? It's called a mycotic aneurysm, and I want to talk to you about why your oral health is so important to your overall health. Yesterday, I presented the case of a 48-year-old man who came to the emergency department with flu-like symptoms and an acute headache. About a month ago, he had four rotten teeth pulled, and he began feeling like he had the flu about two weeks ago. He didn't go to the doctor, and then all of a sudden today, he had the sudden onset of an excruciating headache. In the emergency department, he was running a fever and had tachycardia, or fast heart rate. On the CT scan of his brain that was performed in the emergency department, he had a small intracranial hemorrhage, or a bleed, inside of his brain. That led them to get a CT angiogram where we look at the blood vessels inside of the brain, and here we see a very small mycotic aneurysm. This aneurysm led to this hemorrhage, and this can potentially be life-threatening. So let's talk about it. Hopefully by the end of this video, you'll understand why it is so important that you brush your teeth twice a day and that you visit your dentist regularly for oral checkups. It's American Heart Month, so I want to stress how important our cardiac health is to our overall well-being, including your brain. Many conditions are linked to poor oral health, including cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and some types of cancer, even Alzheimer's disease. So let's talk about how his simple tooth extraction led to an intracranial hemorrhage inside of his brain. You must first understand that the gums have a lot of blood vessels and the mouth is full of bacteria. Tooth extraction creates an open wound inside of your mouth and a cracked tooth can also do the same thing where bacteria from this tooth can then enter the bloodstream. And as you probably know, all blood flow goes through our heart, which is full of several different types of valves. And if bacteria enters the bloodstream, they can actually latch onto the valves in our heart. That's called endocarditis. Now, folks that are at highest risk for endocarditis are those that have congenital heart defects or valve replacements. But to be honest, anybody can develop endocarditis. It also has a little bit of a higher prevalence in people that are immunosuppressed, like those that are on chemotherapy or even diabetics. And we often see endocarditis in IV drug users because they can transiently cause bacteria to enter their bloodstream through needles that enter their skin. But not everybody that has endocarditis has these risk factors like our patient. He's a pretty healthy guy. So if you remember the history, I said that he had his teeth extracted and then two weeks later, he started to develop flu-like symptoms. That's whenever his endocarditis began, which is typically 10 to 14 days after having a tooth extraction. Symptoms of endocarditis are very similar to the flu. You can run a fever, you can feel lethargic and have body aches and pains. Because he did not go to the doctor after developing these symptoms, the bacteria continued to lodge on his heart valve and cycle through his bloodstream. And blood goes to your brain too. Okay, but how do the bacteria cause the aneurysm? Bacteria that are floating through the bloodstream can actually lodge in your blood vessel wall inside of your brain and begin to cause inflammation inside of that blood vessel wall and cause it to weaken. That leads that spot on the blood vessel wall to become weak and can potentially lead to aneurysm formation and rupture. Mycotic aneurysms don't only happen on the brain, they can happen in your aorta or other blood vessels in your body. But if they happen in your brain and rupture, it could potentially cost you your life. Now, mycotic aneurysms are very different in location as compared to other type of more common cerebral aneurysms, which are more likely to form at the base of our brain called the circle of Willis. What you talking about, Willis? I had to throw that in there for any of you that know what I'm talking about. Back to my point, mycotic aneurysms usually happen at the distal terminal segments, usually at our middle cerebral artery. So they happen way out in the end points of our vasculature, whereas other types of intracranial aneurysms happen at the more proximal parts of our arteries in our brain. So they look markedly different on imaging, as well as they are a little bit more difficult to reach surgically. And they don't always have to happen from bacteria, but you can also get them related to fungus or viruses. What do we do to figure out if a patient actually has one of these aneurysms? First need to diagnose the endocarditis, which can be done by an echocardiogram or an ultrasound test of the heart 
to look at the valves of the heart and see if there's bacteria on them. And we also do something called blood cultures, which looks for active bacteria in the bloodstream. We usually do something called a transesophageal echocardiogram, which gives us a much better picture of the heart where we go through the esophagus to feed a camera deeper and closer to the heart. And in our patient, he had a TEE, which confirmed the endocarditis and his blood cultures were positive. It's actually positive for a bug called Streptococcus viridans, which is a common bacteria that lives in our mouth and a common cause of endocarditis and mycotic aneurysms. Unfortunately, they're more common to be diagnosed after they rupture inside of the brain, and that's when they can become a major problem. Now, our patient was lucky because his intracerebral hemorrhage was pretty small, but in some cases, you can get fairly large and even life-threatening brain bleeds due to these aneurysms. Well, how do we treat them? Because the wall of that blood vessel that had the aneurysm is infected, you usually have to treat the patient for six to eight weeks of antibiotics before considering treating the aneurysm. It not only treats the bacteria that is inside of the brain, but it also treats the endocarditis, which is on the heart valve. There's a lot of variables here in treatment. It really depends on the location of the aneurysm, the size, and what type of bacteria or other type of bug is causative. But once they finish their course of antibiotic treatments, they will then get treated for the aneurysm, which can be open surgery versus endovascular treatments like stenting and or coiling. Nowadays, open surgery is pretty uncommon due to the technological advances in endovascular treatment. Not to mention that finding these aneurysms that are in the distal part of our arteries can be really challenging intraoperatively. Early detection and medical and surgical treatment can improve mortality. In hospital patients with a diagnosed mycotic aneurysm, the mortality rate is up to 30%, and if the aneurysm ruptures, it can be anywhere from 50 to 75%. It means you have to have 50-50 shot of survival if the aneurysm ruptures. If that's not enough information to make you wanna brush your teeth every day and go see the dentist for routine checkups, I don't know what else I can tell you. Not really gonna dive too deep into this, but infective endocarditis can even damage the valves on your heart and can need valve replacement in some patients. These cases can be quite tricky to deal with. Fortunately for our patient, he was diagnosed with infective endocarditis and was appropriately treated with IV antibiotics for six weeks and he had no damage to his heart valves. After undergoing his course of IV antibiotics, he then had his aneurysm successfully endovascularly treated. Fortunately for him, he had no long-term neurological deficits related to this injury. So please remember that your heart and brain health can be significantly correlated to our oral hygiene. Another case of patient-focused and compassionate care? Stay tuned next week and I'll go through another case. Now go brush and floss your teeth.